Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us again this afternoon for this webinar. We're so happy to have you here today. And I'm going to be passing it on to Vince from Costi for us today um, to present the webinar. So thank you all. And uh, we hope that this will be a good session for you. Well, thank you, Dina. Um, and welcome, everybody. It's a pleasure to be back. Um, uh, unfortunately, Farishta Dinshaw, who was to do the presentation, uh, was not able. So um, you have me in her place, but I'm always glad um, to be able to connect with people virtually and have this uh, wonderful opportunity, as I said, to have a knowledge exchange. And, and I really want to hear a lot from you. It's really, really important. I think it really adds to any material or content that I bring forward from my experience. So I really look forward to hearing from you. And, um, and, and the best way to do that is please feel free to either um, comment or raise your hand um, or one of the things that we did at the last presentation that I thought worked really well is uh, type in a question or a comment in the chat box and, and, and Dina was so kind to read them out um, and, and that way we can have um, a dialogue. So again, welcome. I'm Vince Pietro Paolo. I work as the general manager of the Family Mental Health Center at Costi where I do a number of different, I have a number of different roles apart from a, having a clinical practice um, I also manage the center, do some program development, and we work very closely with um, our settlement services and in the settlement sector. So I'm going to start today with a quote by Mark Twain. So everybody or some of you may have heard Mark Twain say that, you know, and, I, and this is the way I see self-care is, it's like, the, and Mark Twain said that, um, it's, you know, self-care is like the weather. Everybody talks about the weather, but no one seems to do anything about it. And I feel the same way about self-care. Everybody talks about self-care, but when I talk to people about it, very few people seem to practice. So keep that in mind. Um, at least that's been my experience. So we're going to talk a little bit about self-care today. I, again, come from Costi, and I'm assumed that most of you know about Costi. It is um, probably the largest immigrant serving agency in Toronto. I can't say for all of Canada but definitely in Toronto, and it's been around for about 60 years. And, 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 and the mission really is to help people from diverse communities uh, reach their potential uh, by providing employment, education, and social services to newcomers. So today's agenda, um, we're, we're gonna start with identifying and, and, um, and indicate, and, and so you have a general sense of what are the indicators of stress. We're going to define burnout, compassion, uh, compassion, fatigue, and vicarious trauma, so we all have a common understanding. Then I want to talk a little bit about organizational protocols and policies, and then I guess the best part is to really um, delve into exactly what self-care is, and more specifically, we're going to talk a little bit about mindfulness, and hopefully if we have time, even practice some mindfulness. So that's our agenda uh, for this afternoon. And our learning outcomes will be to, hopefully by the end of the presentation, you're gonna be able to recognize the signs of distress within yourself, to understand the difference between uh, what burnout, compassion, fatigue, and vicarious trauma are. And then that not only will you learn some helpful self-care practices, hopefully you'll implement them. And the whole point is, is, that, um, is that people take from this presentation um, a real desire and a motivation to actually implement self-care. And I do want to hear from people who um, have implemented self-care practices as they do some of the difficult work um, that we do when working with newcomers. So let's start with workplace stress. Um, and I think that if you've been around, whether it's a day, a week, a month, a year, or even 20 years, or perhaps even 30 years like I've been in the sector. And I, my apologies, the uh, slide um, just skipped on me. Um, there is a certain amount of level that naturally occurs in, in work, um, just by coming into work, um, tensions perhaps with colleagues, um, delivering the service. It, there is just natural levels of stress. 
But first and foremost, I think what affects all of us today as we have transitioned <clears throat> from an in-person services for the most part, uh, many of you may have um, already been working online, but COVID has dramatically shifted the way we work, how we work, and it definitely has increased for some um, levels of stress. And, and we do know and we've read reports about the impact of COVID on our mental health. I mean, for, for most of us now, we work at home. We're isolated, disconnected from maybe the support system that we had. Um, and we're using different ways of communicating and delivering our service. the fears of contracting COVID, um, the fear, and I'm sorry, I think my internet is unstable. There we go. I, hopefully I didn't cut off. I just got a message. Um, but COVID definitely, there's many fears, even perhaps the fear of contracting the virus, um, having family members that you're living with who go out. And, and definitely when you're working at home, there is a different level of tension. Um, if you're like me, you're running around from room to room, making sure that you're not in a dead spot of Wi-Fi in the house. And that's a challenge um, as I work with other members of my family um, and, and using Wi-Fi. So, like I said, apart from the fear of contracting virus, the pain, the suffering, the depression of what COVID has done um, to our communities, to our city, to our lives, um, and, and just... I think what I've been hearing from people lately is just they're tired. They're really, really tired and this change and, and starting to have anxiety about the future of how this is going to impact. And, and, and also what COVID has done is, is worried people in administrative positions as well as frontline workers about what is all this going to mean for um, our survival, um, not only physically, but the survival of the organization, our services, um, and definitely there is financial insecurity um, that is part of COVID and as we worry about the economy. Now, if we didn't have COVID, <clears throat> naturally, um, there, these are just fears that um, and stress that people may think about in their work days. So this is uh, pre-COVID, but I, I think more intensified um, during COVID and possibly post-COVID is the fear of being laid off. We know that funders these days continue to reorganize, um, look at efficiencies, look at outcomes. There's definitely a lot more pressure. So I think all staff um, in the back of their mind are concerned about possible cuts. And as I said earlier about funders is, and, and clients as well, the rising expectations that come, there definitely is more stringent performance evaluation um, and the expectations are qu quite high. Um, perhaps you work in an environment where your work is not validated. Um, you may work for an organization or perhaps a supervisor or manager who doesn't validate or appreciate your work. So the lack of validation, um, even though you're trying and they're motivated to um, work very hard and diligently, um, the lack of validation really affects us in so many different ways. It leaves us kind of empty, perhaps hollow. It can create a toxic work environment and, and influence the relationships we have with our colleagues. Nothing worse than workplace bullying, and it doesn't necessarily have to be from a supervisor or for, <clears throat> for management. It, it, it could be from colleagues. And, and of course, we do know we often when we see the word bullying, and we often see this with children, we think of school, but it happens often in workplaces where there's harassment. And it could be from harassment from clients. It could be from colleagues and it could be from management. Um, and it really affects our self-esteem. Um, it affects our sense of worth, but it also affects us deeply on an emotional level. It could lead to agitation, depression, and avoidance, um, increase of sick days. People want to avoid an environment where it's toxic and where they're belittled and devalued. So the last one, which I kind of hinted at, is dealing with difficult client situations. The clients we work with, newcomers, I think, have been through tremendous amount of stress, 
because of migration, and, and for the most part, a lot of it is forced migration. Um, when I speak to many of the newcomers, a lot of them loved their homeland, perhaps before a war broke out, um, before there was some kind of um, perhaps new government that may be authoritarian, or perhaps that there's laws and legislations that um, oppress people, prosecute people that have different gender identities, dif different sexual orientations. So often the, the clients we see are, are, are distressed. And, and when people are distressed, they present perhaps in ways that may be aggressive, um, perhaps they communicate in ways that are demanding, and they also present us with very difficult situations to deal with, dilemmas um, and, and, and exceptions that often really, really test um, our abilities and, and our confidence. So these are some of the workplace um, stressors that continuously affect our mental health, our emotional well-being. And I don't know if I missed any. Does anybody have any um, stressors uh, related to work that they'd like to add that perhaps I missed or I'm not aware of? And Dina, please let me know. Um, I'm going to move on to the next slide. But if someone comments, please let me know. And I'm more <laughs> than happy um, to share with everybody and also added um, to my slide or at least my, um, my knowledge base. Okay, nothing so far. So how do you know that you are experiencing stress? Um, one of the ways is that you feel there is a sense of futility about your work. Um, you start to have self-talk or at least thoughts enter your consciousness where you may say, well, this doesn't really matter. Nothing at this job ever changes. Why bother? So you, you start to take this apathetic view towards your work, perhaps even maybe towards your clients. And, and definitely negativity, as you can see, is starting to set in. So if you hear yourself um, in your consciousness, in your thought content, utter words, perhaps maybe not out loud, but even in your mind, you're starting to perhaps um, feel and definitely thinking um, about your work situation. And this could be an indication that you may be stress and stress related to work. Perhaps there are other stressors, but this is focused more on work. Okay. <clears throat> yes. Stressors. We have a comment uh, sure. about access to communication and another comment about working from home. The work life balance is more difficult. Thank you very much. Those are excellent comments. So, uh, sorry, I missed the first one, Dina. Access to communication. Thank you. Absolutely. So accessing communication um, is, um, is, is, is really stressful and also absolutely related to COVID and working from home and really that line and that boundary between home and work is really, really, actually it's no longer even blurred. Um, I think technology blurred it for us, right? Our phone is consistently going off, constantly getting emails, but now we're actually at home working. So there's no longer even a boundary. It's kind of seamless and you're right. It's really hard to find that balance. Yeah. Um, we have so, another comment um, sure. of isolation and mm -hmm. another uh, participant said online learning for students is very intense. Absolutely. Great comments. Thank you. This is wonderful feedback, but online learning is difficult. It's very, very challenging. Um, it also depends on your skill level, but also really it, there are limitations with online learning in terms of communication and interactions. Um, and, and the last one, isolation. Um, absolutely. Um, isolation is actually a lot more serious than people um, give thought to. And, and, I'm, and I'm glad someone raised that. Um, and I'll tell you that if you, I, I read an article not too long ago where in one of the North European uh, countries, they actually now have a minister of loneliness. So there's a minister of finance, perhaps a minister of culture. There's a minister of loneliness. And although the article was focused on the elderly and how lonely they are, I think COVID has really, I think, um, given people permission to speak of isolation and loneliness. Um, and, and it's not only because they don't get perhaps the social 
um, um, they don't have the socialization that comes with work. Um, and, and, but if you live alone, you're very isolated. You could even be isolated in your family, but isolation is key. Um, and definitely isolation is, is one of those variables and the contributing factors that leads to depression, anxiety, um, and often to hopelessness. And, and in the most severe case, um, suicidal thoughts, gestures, and, and, and suicide. So it is something that, thank you for raising that, that is really, really important. Um, and, and I'm gonna go back to, so we talked about futility and isolation, of course, contributes to that. Increased anxiety reactions, uh, both now with COVID, but also working at home. Um, anxiety about, I hope that my, you know, and I can tell you the anxiety I feel whenever I do an online presentation is, I hope my Wi-Fi um, um, doesn't go down. Um, I'm hoping that somehow um, that my PowerPoint is working. Um, but when you work in your settlement work, I think you have all that when you're interacting with your clients by phone or online through virtual arrangements. But even in the office and in person, there's definitely um, anxiety related. Did I do everything I could to help this person? Was there anything I didn't do? You may bring those thoughts back to you at work and at home, um, especially if you see that a client may have disclosed to you some personal or intimate information. Did I do the right thing? Did I follow up? Um, and definitely the tensions that people feel anxiety when there's tensions in the office, when offices are toxic, or just every day from the workload and the volume of work from due dates and, and, and having to perform and meet deadlines. Um, another indicator of stress is that your energy levels are low. Um, keep in mind that depression is not just an emotional um, disorder um, where you feel perhaps sad, irritable, but it's very physical as, as well. There are physical symptoms related to depression, and one of those is low and en low energy levels. So if your energy level is low and you have difficulty getting up and 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 just meeting the demands of work and the pressures and what you're exposed and witnessing um, through the stories and pain of the people you work with, it can affect you. But low energy level is one of the physical symptoms of depression, as well as when we talk about affect and, and having a flat affect, and that's related to how you feel, sort of feeling flat, your interests. So if perhaps a colleague says, let's go out for lunch or let's go out for a walk and your energy level's low, but also you feel just flat, not necessarily sad, but flat. There's no high, um, in, and no energy, but there's no high in your emotion. Nothing really kind of excites you. Another indicator that you're stressed is, of course, irritability and anger. And we often see this um, as, um, as a reaction to stress. We see intensity. We could be angry with perhaps a colleague or a manager or policy. Um, and anger we often is directed at the organization, at leaders within the organization, or even colleagues. And just an overall sense of irritability, right? You don't have that tranquility or that calmness but there's an um, inner sense of irritability. And you could see this by sometimes physical ways where people pace and, and they have physical kind of restlessness, either their legs or they feel it in their muscles and in their nerves. Um, but there's definitely a body language. Um, and that comes from suppressing and repressing stress. So the way you're dealing with the issues at work, perhaps, or issues in your life, is yet you're holding on to them. Also a sign of anger is, is pain, right? People can be in psychological and emotional pain and it often is expressed through anger and irritability, okay? So these are some of the emotional and physical signs of stress that I want you to become aware of. Some are emotionally based, um, again, and some are very physical. And remember things like headaches, um, and, um, and back pain and knee pain. These also sometimes are attributed to um, emotional stress that manifests physically. I often see in my clinical practice is I ask people and say, you know, how are you feeling today? And they say, fine. Um, and then what they tell me 
um, and, and they perhaps don't have the language um, or have difficulty expressing, or there's stigma with perhaps saying that you're feeling depressed and the way it is communicated is through, I have pain in my back or my stomach's upset or it's bloated. And often these also are symptoms of stress and, and sometimes depression and anxiety. So if you ever look up symptoms of anxiety and depression, you'll see that there are also physical symptoms. And physical symptoms are really manifestations of emotional um, distress. So if- Vince, we just have yep. a comment from the audience. Sure. Um, the comment is clients' expectations have risen considerably and so is their demands. They think that working from home is comfortable as we are working from the comfort of our home, but there's little idea about the intensity of working from home. I do feel muscle cramps and aches as well. Good, thank you. And absolutely, I, I, you know, you got to remember that clients see you as all-knowing, all-powerful. You're going to be the one to solve everything that ails um, their lives and they really see you as, as heroic. They, they, they rarely will see you as somebody who, um, you know, as, as someone who cannot achieve or could not um, fulfill their wishes um, or their goals. I often hear sometimes from my clients and they see me professionally, and I'm sure you've experienced this. I've heard them say, boy, your life must be perfect. Um, Absolutely not. I think none of our lives are perfect. We all have periods of stress. We all have issues that we need to deal with, whether it's relationship issues, um, whether it's financial issues, whether it's parent-child issues, school issues. We're essentially in the same boat, but keep in mind that our clients, their expectations absolutely have increased, but also the way they envision you, right, as a very powerful person as a person who's going to support and help them. And they need to have, whether it's a fantasy that they need to have because they feel perhaps maybe um, vulnerable um, and they need to see you as such because they need to hang on to um, the hope um, that many newcomers want to maintain in order for their life to improve um, or get better. Okay, so we talked about, and not to say that the indications of stress that I mentioned in my earlier slide are not severe, but these are ones that I've kind of listed that are really start to move into um, another category um, and are quite severe. And this definitely um, is an indication that you're overwhelmed, stressed. And, and one thing we see is an increased dependency on substances and whether that substance is, and I'm hearing about this too, um, even just looking at it based on the lineups at the LCBO, and, and uh, you probably have read how LCBO sales have skyrocketed. So some people are turning to alcohol um, to distress as alcohol is a way of kind of coping. Um, so if we start to see dependency on alcohol, dependency on perhaps other stu substances, if, if, if as one of the comments stated, you start to feel some physical symptoms and pain, people may turn to prescription drugs or over the counter um, medications to alleviate some of that muscular pain um, or other. And, and you can see this and the dependencies, and, and I've seen this, um, in my work is it could be just on things like Rolaids where people are just dropping Rolaids like, like they would candy. And so any kind of dependency and overuse and, and um, of a substance just to alleviate the stress. So compulsive behaviors and, and, and this is breaking down. So we see maybe increase in gambling, overeating. We're, start, we're seeing this and I'm hearing about people gaining um, COVID-19 pounds, I've heard people say, and, and that comes from the way they're dealing with stress is by overeating or not eating, overspending, online shopping. And we call those process addictions. So things like online shopping, um, overeating, they're behaviorally based. So you got to remember that your dependency and, and, and perhaps is not necessarily just on substances, but it could be in activities where you're taking away time um, from loved ones, maybe perhaps time even from work to deal with the stress by engaging in activities um, that you become dependent on. And we see this with teenagers and even some with adults in gaming, internet gambling, um, but overspending and shopping are also examples of process addictions. Reactive behavior where it moves from anger and irritability to 
aggression. Now, aggression is a behavior. And what drives aggression often is anger, which is the emotion, and aggression is the behavior. So, move, so throwing objects is an example. Um, at worst case scenario, it's actually hitting. Um, and reactive behavior could be where you have bouts of crying in situations where you normally would not. And remember, crying is a behavior, and it is not an emotion. Uh, the emotion may be sadness, maybe anger. Often people cry in anger. Sometimes people cry when they're elated and happy, right? Um, but generally, we're talking about reactive behaviors that um, are due to stress. So you may have bouts of crying, and you don't really know why, or you're just or just feeling overwhelmed, either the volume of the work or the pressure or the intensity of the work. Again, we talked about chronic physical ailments and this is where physical pains do not go away. And you see this when people have headaches or perhaps tension in their shoulders or in their neck or even consistent um, and most anxiety and, and depression also manifests in, in GI or gastrointestinal symptoms. So whether you're bloated, you can be constipated or you can be the opposite and have bouts of diarrhea. So these are also examples. Often when um, you go to your family doctor because perhaps you have a prolonged case of a GI symptom and they start to investigate it and they don't find anything and often your doctor says, well, it's probably stress. And it's hard sometimes for people to connect. But really what happens is when you are stressed out, if you look at it, your muscles tense and they tense over a long period of time. And if your, muscle, if your muscles are tense, eventually um, it, it is going to hurt. They could get inflamed. And the same thing in terms of what you eat and, and, and there's pressure on your stomach. And remember that stress changes your body chemistry, both biologically and physiologically. And so you're gonna have um, physical symptoms um, a, a, across the whole spectrum. So. Another indicator is you're not taking care of yourself. So really poor, poor self-care. Often when people are, are stressed to the max um, and are depressed and perhaps anxiety, one, one thing we see is they're not taking care of their appearance. Um, and, and that comes from poor self-worth, poor self-esteem, but also feeling sad or anxious. You're moving away from things um, and, and, and really reflect. So poor hygiene and, and disheveled appearance often reflects that your capacity to take care of yourself is somewhat diminished. Any other severe indicators that I may have missed that people want to perhaps share? Um, we have a comment about insomnia and looking for reassurance among friends and colleagues because you cannot stand the uncertain times related to anxiety. Thank you, excellent comments, absolutely. Um, Sorry, sweet wanting to sleep too much more more than regular absolutely so whether if sleep is is and i'm glad you brought sleep up so if you're sleep if you're either sleeping too much or sleeping too little it could be a sign of stress if your sleep is fragmented meaning that you sleep for an hour and then you keep getting up every hour or two hours or so um difficulty with sleep is, is really a strong indication of stress. And often you'll see psychiatrists when they're treating depressions or anxiety, they'll ask you about your sleep and your sleeping patterns. And if you are not able to replenish um, through sleep or reinvigorate through sleep, um, this is when psychiatrists start looking at medication as an option because we do know that sl poor sleep habits um, and, and fragmentation of sleep really leads to um, worsening of a depression or deepening of a depression or a, a severe increase in anxiety. Um, and, and that's when doctors will start to consider uh, that perhaps maybe they need to treat this medically if nothing else seems to be working. So I'm gonna have, have a poll. Comments before you continue. Yeah. Um, one is working in your sleep and the other is waking up in the middle of the night and thinking about work or related tasks. You're definitely stressed if, if you're continuously cannot separate as, as someone earlier mentioned that the line between home and work now is is, is pretty seamless and there's no there's no separation and definitely if you are having nightmares or persistent conscious thoughts about work, whether it's in your sleep or pre-conscious uh, level where you're consistently have ruminating or thinking about work, you're definitely stressed. Um, 
and and you're not able to separate emotionally um, in this case in terms of your thought content um, and you're not able to separate your thoughts so that is definitely an indicator of of that you are definitely stressed out um, is there any more comments because I'm going to put up a poll Dina and so sure, just yeah. look at um, let me just see um, okay so I'm going to launch this poll before we go into the definitions of burnout, uh, compassion fatigue, and vicarious trauma. I'm going to launch this poll and see, and, and here's the question. I'll read it out. So have any of you experienced one burnout, two compassion fatigue, three vicarious trauma? So um, boy, wow, this is a stressed out bunch, at least from the initial results. Um, Hopefully they'll go lower, but it doesn't seem so. I'm not surprised actually, because I do think um, in in the in the day to day work you do, it's it's already stress um, and, and what you've been exposed to. But um, I think the other um, issue is COVID and working from home definitely has dramatically increased the levels of stress. So we have 88 percent of responses of response of, of response of oh, Excuse me, I'm tongue tied there. So 88% of respondents said yes, they have experienced one of the three. 7% um, said no, and 5% don't know. And the reason why I did this before is I want to make sure that I'm, I'm going to give you the poll again after we go through uh, the definitions and to see if they're the same. So did I share the results? Here they are. So here are the results. Um, evidence-based, everything I do is evidence-based. So um, here are the results of our polls and, and we'll take this poll again a little later. Um, okay, so, so burnout um, is indicated by cynicism, depression, lethargy, and, oh, bear with me here. I'm just trying to, um, see if I, okay, um, just moving my, um, um, so sorry, uh, burnout is indicated by cynicism, depression, lethargy, and is not, it is not just a simple um, result of long hours. So keep this in mind, it's not about how long you work to experience burnout, it's really about your attitude um, and your emotions and your physical energy level. So if you're becoming more cynical about what you do, if you're starting to experience flatness, as I said earlier, or sadness, or just this low energy and feeling depressed, um, it may not necessarily be related to the long hours you work. It's, it's probably an indication. And the key one for me is cynicism. And so when you start talking about your clients um, in ways that perhaps is... Um, in a way harmful when you're cynical about the system and the system doesn't help anybody or funders or a community or our politicians, that can be um, not just an overall attitude um, about injustice in, in our community, in our world, but it could be related to the stress that you are experiencing due to work. So this, can, this generally um, can occur when you're not in control of how you carry out your job. Um, and this, of course, in our field is all the time. Our funders dictate, there's a call for proposals with very little warning. Um, there's changes in funding structures. Um, there's new targets that come up. Um, and also when you're working toward your goals, they don't seem to resonate with you. And, you. and I often hear this from many people is that the funder's goals are not necessarily aligned with client goals. Um, and that really is an ethical challenge for most people. And, and it really challenges your values. And, and this is often what leads to cynicism. Um, and you can start to really, really burn out. I've seen this um, often with many workers. Um, so keep that in mind. And, and as someone said, the lack of validation and social support. If you're not, if people don't value the work you do, if you're not being, if it's, if it's being dismissed or belittled um, that often, especially with not only the colleagues, but the agency itself and the funding bodies, I keep adding that 
um, our work needs to be validated um, to get a sense um, that we um, have accomplished something, that we are participating in change, and we're improving not only the lives of the people that we serve, but the community in which we live in. So any questions about burnout? So, and, and maybe I'll wait for questions at the end. So what is the difference between burnout and, and compassion fatigue? So compassion fatigue as, um, and this is a, a definition, there's many definitions. This is the one I tend to lean towards. Um, so it's natural, predictable, treatable, and preventable. Oh, my apologies. Un unwanted consequence of working with suffering people is an extreme state of tension and preoccupation with the suffering of those being helped to the degree that it can create a secondary traumatic stress for the helper. So what compassion fatigue is, it's really telling us that when we work with people who are in a suffering emotional state or have endured, like many of our clients, trauma um, and challenges that really are testing them, and you see the suffering and, and their pain in their faces, in their stories, um, even in their actions and their behaviors, whether they're positive behaviors um, or whether they're negative behaviors where sometimes our clients may be demanding. Um, and we've seen incidences where people have had outbursts um, and aggressive outbursts. So you're dealing with people who are suffering. It's not uncommon that you're going to be affected. And one thing to remember is, is that the effect is cumulative. Um, that over time, if you're not practicing self-care or if you're not um, working towards reducing that level of tension or stress and you continuously become preoccupied, um, that you will, con you will feel the compassion fatigue. So the difference between burnout and compassion fatigue is compassion fatigue relates to your experiences with your client. And this is not necessarily related even to clients um, or trauma work. It's just related to the day-to-day -day interactions and exposure to people who are suffering. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be because of a trauma. So it's just hearing the stories, experiencing the emotional um, fallout and, and witnessing and being exposed to those tensions and that creates compassion fatigue. So what does it do to somebody? And think about it, you become desensitized to some degree, um, it, you normalize a suffering experience, but it's related to your interactions um, with the client. And as it says, your ability to be compassionate, to be empathetic is diminished. And that's one of the key indicators that you no longer see your clients as suffering and your, your desire to help them is reduced or somewhat diminished. Um, your ability to be empathetic, to hear um, is really diminished. It's almost like a computer on overload, right? It doesn't perform the same way um, that it, it would um, when you kind of clean up all the viruses. So oh, it's accumulative over time. Um, you normalize suffering um, and it gives you a diminished capacity to be empathetic. Okay, so now we're gonna go to the third, which um, we hear this often in our work. And this is more related again to clients who have suffered trauma or experienced trauma. And this is what vicarious trauma is. It's the cumulative <clears throat> transformative effect. Oh, my apologies. Um, on the helper of working with survivors of traumatic life events, both positive and negative. So that's McCann and Perlman. That's an older definition. And a more newer one is, um, and, and, and a more concrete one, which is that workers have repeated exposure to trauma narrative. It may affect the personal sense of safety, trust, and control. And this is when, within ourselves. So this means that our own personal safety, our ability to trust, and our ability to control our lives um, becomes compromised um, and becomes invaded. So essentially, vicarious trauma is then that now we because of the narrative that we've been um, exposed to and witnessed is we're suffering some of the same symptoms of trauma that our clients. Um, so, and what it really does is it starts to alter your worldview. And this is a key indication. So if you can trust, so for instance, if you start develop ideas like I can't trust the government, I don't trust anybody, I can't trust my colleague, 
um, and you feel like you, there's ex and the excessive need for control or your emotional safety or any part of your personal safety is, um, is compromised and you constantly need to reassure yourself, you may have, um, you may be experiencing vicarious trauma. So think of it in terms of your worldview being completely altered. So those are the three differences. So again, burnout relates, um, um, burnout relates to thinking, you know, communicating cynicism, um, not making a difference. Um, it's related to your work. Um, compassion fatigue is the cumulative effect of the interactions with your clients, right? That your ability to be empathetic is diminished. Um, vicarious trauma relates to a trauma narrative that you start to develop similar symptoms of the traumatic clients that you are serving. So keeping that in mind, um, before I move to the next slide, what I want to do is um, I will now want to ask and and um, and have a poll. Um, and I'm just trying to get, I don't see. Um, oh, there it is. So why don't we and I don't know if I can do this is yeah, I can I think I can um, relaunch the poll. There we go. So I'm going to relaunch the poll now that you know the definitions, and then I'll hear comments. I'm curious to see if people um, have experienced any of the three, and if the results will be similar. Remember, I think we had 88%. So yeah, I think as people realize, and as we went through the definitions, it sounds like more of you, so we moved a couple of percentages. There's some people, 10%, who still don't know, or know they haven't, um, and I hope that that 10% are practicing good self-care. So when it comes to the self-care part of this presentation, I want to hear from you. Um, I'm going to share the results to you with you, and um, so we we do have an increase of about two percent. I think eighty eight percent, and now we have ninety percent, and that's thirty five respondents as compared to four respondents um, for no. Okay, so thank you for participating. Any comments um, or any questions related to the definitions? Again, these. The definition, keep in mind, is these are just some of the definitions related to the three um, key um, experiences that one faces in doing this work. They're by no means, um, there's many different definitions, um, and, and I encourage you to go online and, and, um, and, um, and check out. But these are the ones that I'm using for this particular presentation that I feel um, may um, give you quick information that you can process easily. Okay, so if there's no questions, I'm going to move. Well, who's vulnerable? So the, 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 nec the next is, is who's vulnerable to, to vicarious trauma? Sorry, who's, who's at increased risks? Or what, um, and, and what we find out is, and, and as we know, we, we've talked about trauma before, you can have two people go to war, one, one person both experiencing the same particular traumatic event, they both come back and they survive the war. One person just goes back to normal functioning. The second person is hospitalized in a hospital and has severe issues with functioning and severe post-traumatic distress. And we still don't know, but this is what our understanding is in terms of contributing factors. Definitely, there are personal vulnerabilities. So aspects of your personality, your resiliency. So. Are you a resilient person? Have you been able to, do you have a capacity and are aware of your capacity and have, have acknowledged your own personal um, resilience and resiliency and have worked towards building resiliency? Your own personality traits. Some people um, are more reactive, some are less reactive. Um, some people are a little bit more philosophical, more tranquil, some people, so, all aspects of your personality or so, if you have a lack of uh, resources and resilience, you may be more increased to developing vicarious trauma or burnout. It depends on your worldview and, and, and your personal philosophy as well. So work-related traumatic grief and loss, and this relates to exposure at work, right? And the number of exposure, you, you, if, if you have, um, we, we recently, there was a colleague um, who we worked with for over 25 years and, and recently died. It's really had um, 
a, a traumatic effect on all of us because of the way he died, um, the quickness of the death, and just um, it seemed like it happened overnight. So this really affected people's um, I, I, it really affected people emotionally and psychologically and also about the workplace, right? The physical environment. So um, whether you've had direct exposure to a traumatic event or not, um, or indirect trauma, um, again, we talked about the em empathic strain. So we talked about w what this does to you in terms of your empathy. Um, and then if the system is failing you, right, and your working conditions, are they toxic? Are they supportive? Um, and then the social cultural context that you're working on. So these are some of the um, multiple exposures. And, and so think about this um, within yourself, right, as, as a way to see, are you at increased or at a lower risk? So this is kind of a quick guide. Um, and this comes from Dr. Leslie Ann Rose from UCLA, who studied this and looked at these particular elements that will um, are related in determining it at who is at increased risk of developing um, vicarious trauma, perhaps burnout, as well as compassion fatigue. Okay, any questions related to this particular slide? about who's at increased risk or, or, or vulnerability. So if and this is all, go ahead. So if, I, I think someone perhaps is not on mute. So if, if, if um, or unless there's a question and I'm missing it. <laughs> Sorry, if your microphone, that would be really helpful. I think. Uh, Vince, you can unmute yourself. Okay, thank you. Um, and can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, good. So I'm going to move on to the next slide. I'm just going to check time. Okay, ooh, I'm going to have to move this along. Um, okay, so. There we go, self-care policies. I'm gonna sort of move along quickly here because this is probably not the most exciting part of the presentation, but essentially um, one of the most important um, issues that we're looking at now is organizational policies related to the well-being of staff. And I was just talking to Dina before the presentation started, and I was glad to hear that the organization she works with, Okazi, has a committee um, that looks at wellness and well-being of staff. Um, and I'm not sure what their role is, but essentially, um, and frontline workers or any workers need to look at this, talk to leadership, um, unless you are leadership, and looking at developing protocols to support staff, to support uh, mental health, uh, positive mental health, um, and improved well-being of the people you work with. The more healthy staff is, um, the better, I think they're gonna serve clients. Um, so this is, is around um, developing protocols around child protection, contacting police, dealing with aggressive behaviors, dealing with self-harming behavior and pseudos, because this really helps people. And, and the reason why I put this and it's important to have protocols is one of the most stressful things in life is actually making decisions, right? So when you assess someone's um, job and when they're doing job evaluations they're looking at the frequency of decisions um, the impact of the decision making and that's how you kind of evaluate um, a job and when you're looking at performance so if you look at for instance we take a ceo or an executive director the, they their decisions and their choices impact the whole agency right Perhaps when we make a decision and we're working with a client, it may just impact the it may just impact the client, but it also could impact the agency. Um, but that's what I mean by the, the level of stress. Um, so, for instance, if an ED there's massive funding cuts and has to reduce staff, that decision and that level of stress weighs. So, one of the, the protocols also to develop is help people to guide decision-making, right? So it reduces the kind of stress. So if they know how to deal with aggressive behaviors, if they know when to contact 
protection services or police, that reduces stress. So it's not just developing policies around time for self-care or, or honoring self-care and well-being. It's also providing different supports as well that will reduce the level of stress. So again, a comfortable environment, personal days that can be used as mental health days. If people are having a difficult mental health, you know, we often say, great, if, if you're not well physically, take the day off or use a sick day. But I, I think now more and more, if someone needs a mental health day because they're feeling stress, um, I do believe the environment is better. I'm not saying it's perfect. It's less of a stigma. And, and more and more people are saying, I need a mental health day. I'm overwhelmed. And I just need a day to be at home um, or perhaps go for a walk um, or, or have a break. So more and more you're seeing accommodative work schedules. That hopefully helps the work-life balance, um, reasonable workloads and, and reasonable expectations. And of course, opportunity for training to improve uh, skill level. These are all very important supports that can be done at an organizational level. Team building activities, regular supervision is actually so important to have a positive space with your supervisor to debrief and work on constructive ideas together. And of course, the recognition of personal and professional compliments validating someone's work, um, not just being compensated, but recognizing it um, is really, really important to building morale, confidence. So I went through that quickly because I really want to focus on self-care and I want to make sure we have enough time for that. Um, so what is self-care? So self-care, um, as defined by Eleanor Brown, this is just a quote I like, and I tried to give you an image, um, one of my favorite painters, um, is Claude Monet and, and the, these are the white water lilies. And, and I tried to give you an image that kind of brings some kind of tranquility with soothing colors. So rest and self-care are so important. When you take time to replenish your spirit, it allows you to serve others from the overflow. You could not serve from an empty vessel. And the reason why I like this quote is that it allows us to replenish. When we're overflowed, we, can, we are like an empty vessel, we cannot serve. So I encourage self-care. I hope your organization does, but really the motivation has to come from within you. Even if you don't have the encouragement from your organization, from your work, you take charge of that. You know, as, as Mahatma Gandhi said, be the change you want to. So the motivation has to be internal. It has to come from you. And it includes, and this is the key word here, intentional actions that you take care of both from a physical, mental, spiritual, and emotional health. So you're not just looking at your physical health. We're often obsessed with, with our physical bodies and being in shape and eating right and taking care of ourselves physically. But we also need to intentionally make time for our mental health, for our spiritual health. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. And more importantly, our emotional health, right? So there is no one formula or one self-care strategy. It's really depends on the interests, the passions, the personality of the individual. So every self-care strategy is an individual one. There are commonalities, definitely, but essentially it has to be unique and individual because it really, it has to be an intentional act that is internally motivated. So if, if not everybody likes to walk through the woods, right? I know, believe it or not, I don't. I actually find more tranquility and peace walking through the busy uh, city streets, people watching, window shopping. Believe it or not, that actually um, reduces my stress more than walking um, through the woods. I know that may sound strange to some, maybe not to others, but I love cities I, and, and I love the energy. And believe it or not, it kind of, in a, in a, in a, in a kind of strange way, pacifies me and reduces my stress. So the key important here that I want to share with people is you need to make appointments for self-care the way you make your business appointments or your appointments with clients or your appointments with anything, right? You need to make that time. It needs to be added into your calendar. And that goes back to my point, which was it has to be intentional. There has to be some motivation. Okay. So what is self-care? So recovery and healing happen when we find meaning and value in our lives. If you notice, burnout, 
Compassion fatigue, vicarious trauma affects our worldview. It affects our ability to have empathy. So it's really kind of contrasting and conflicting with our values, with our meaning. We often get meaning from our work, right? Our work gives us a sense of satisfaction. We're helping others. We're in the helping profession. We are working to help make a difference in our community, in the people we serve. So if we lose meaning, if we lose value from the experience of our work and our interactions with our clients, we're not going to recover. We, again, see, that's what is, cynicism is, is we start to lose the meaning of our work. It transforms and reshapes our values. So we need healing because it reaffirms the meaning in our life and it helps um, to really... Uh, make a commitment to the values that we hold true and deep in our lives. And how do we do this? Well, self-reflection. Um, and what this is, is, is taking a step out of your everyday life, of your work life, of your family life, of your individual life, and you reflect and you think about it. So you stay in your mind and you reflect about the day um, and you can think about, maybe fill your mind with perhaps positivity, positive self-thinking, positive thoughts, but you can also just reflect on the day as a way of kind of debriefing. So you're thinking about situations, perhaps you're daydreaming. So self-reflection can include all of that. Anybody else want to comment on self-reflection? And also, this is a way to revisit where the direction you're going, the meaning in your life, what you value, what your attitudes are. It's really, really important um, to do that. Okay, so I don't know if there's any comments at all. Um, I just you have a comment. Uh, if you could just briefly go back to the slide before self-care, just for a little bit. This one? This one? Before that, I believe. Sorry, yeah, the first one. So regular supervision and the importance, um, a good supervisor doesn't necessarily micromanage or wanna see you um, to consistently look if you're meeting your targets. It's an opportunity to also talk about the impact of work um, and, and how you feel about work, um, perhaps identify gaps or talk about how things can be improved or really talk about any particular issue. Um, so team building activities are really, really important um, and should be promoted um, and, and because it creates um, an atmosphere of respect and collegial support, right? Um, and recognition of personal and professional accomplishments. Is that okay? Can I move on or? Yeah, thank you, Vince. And then in regards to self-care, we have a comment of uh, sure. keeping a diary of your feelings and another comment of being near your loved one. Thank you, excellent. A great way to self-reflect is to keep a diary every day, right? Um, so you write down uh, your reflections, your thoughts, your emotions, excellent example. One of the things we started doing at the center where I work is, um, is we started to give every woman who's experienced abuse that comes to our Violence Against Women Services just gets a diary, um, and um, and we you know we also communicate to her the importance of keeping that diary safe, right? Because these are personal and intimate reflections, and of course we don't want to put that person at risk. But the importance in all healing really starts with self-reflection. We see this for people who are very, very spiritual, right? We see people that go to perhaps um, a convent or a quiet space, it could be even in the woods, just to be silent, to be alone with their thoughts and not to be afraid of that. Often we're afraid. We, and, and I've noticed that a huge change in our society from just in, in my years, when, when people would go for walks, they would just walk and they would breathe in the air, look at trees or maybe even window shop, look at people. Today, if you look, people are constantly on their phones, right? So there is that, there, there, those are action activities. It's hard to self-reflect on a walk. Um, listen, I'm not, it, it, listening to music is different because listening to music can facilitate reflection, right? You can be caught in your own thought and music can be, um, 
a way to support that. Um, but I'm talking about people answering emails and, and perhaps um, flipping through Twitter and things like that. You know, you don't want to get a you know, and, and I'm sure that people's heart rate goes up every time you get a Trump tweet. I'm not trying to be political, but if it d definitely can change your mood, right? So finding gratitude within you. We often, when we're depressed, angry, irritable, we, we can list our grievances, right? Easily, they come out one after the other, but we need to shift and think about what are we thankful of, um, you know, we have shelter, um, we have food, perhaps we have family, we have our health. So shifting from complaining and the negativity and the grievances and moving towards gratitude. And this is how, again, this is how you shape meaning and value in your life. These are all, all these points are gonna be connected to meaning and value. Another way is through art, um, and creative and expressive pursuits. Movement is, is an expressive art. Um, really tapping into your creativity, whether it's writing, whether it's drawing, um, all these creative ways um, of expressing are really associated with mood. And next time you listen to music, I want you to think about identifying what the mood is. Are you listening to harsh rock and roll and the mood could be angry and rebel, right? Or are you listening to soft music and the mood could be sad or uplifting? So there is emotion in all expressive art. You see this in paintings. So when I referred to Monet's painting, it's tranquil. The colors he chose, the strokes, all want to convey an emotional response. So expressing yourself through art is a way to replenish and heal and process um, emotions. So engaging in positive and constructive community activities or projects. And of course, remember, most of us are here to help people, but really we also, in the back of our minds, is advocating for social change. And we can do this by um, contributing in, in community activities, perhaps joining a political party or being politically active or perhaps a movement and, and things that, you know, walking for cancer care, contributing to the United Way. All these are ways that, um, and actions to promote positive change um, in our society and in our community and making a difference. And I'm a big believer in both faith and spiritual practice. Prayer or meditation are ways to get in touch with your spiritual life. And whether you're an atheist, you're still a spiritual human being. So meditation may be a way to um, get in touch with that spiritual self. Um, and, and for many people, faith um, provides hope, comfort, and nurtures the soul. Right? We often talk about we talk about psychopaths and people without empathy. They're soulless, right? So, and really, they're not in touch with that spiritual world that we all live in, and really encapsulates all of us. So, those are examples. I'm going to give you a quick exercise um, around self care because, um, and this is called the unmirroring exercise, and and mirroring is when we mirror. Um, someone else's behavior. And what this means is if you look in the mirror, right, you see yourself and you see the absolute reflection. Often when we're sitting with our clients, um, we will often mirror their behaviors and we may not even be consciously aware. So this is we take on their emotion, right? Or we mirror their body um, or we mirror their facial expressions as a way of connecting sometimes, it's important. Um, as a way of trying to establish rapport, as a way of communicating. But mirroring also is we're absorbing the emotions, right? Um, and we're taking things in, um, and not necessarily always in a positive way, um, including if, if the narrative is, is hyper and is painful and is suffering, like a traumatic story, we, our breathing patterns may change to reflect and mirror the um, client we're working with. So we're taking on that emotion. We're, we're, we're um, internalizing the thoughts and the narrative that they're expressing. So we need to think about unmirroring exercises. Um, so you'll have better control of your emotions the more you stay in touch with yourself and you and consciously avoid mirroring or stress or distressing responses with your clients. And the way you do that is by sitting up straight, cross or uncross your legs, 
be aware of your breathing, change your breathing. So if it's shallow and rapid, you take a couple of deep breaths. So you slow things down, you write notes to distract yourself. Um, and um, you visit the restroom in between clients, not during a client, you blink your eyes, right? Because sometimes narratives can be quite hypnotizing, right? Um, and we can dissociate. So blinking your eyes is a way of kind of staying awake, taking deep breaths. And again, 10 specific muscles and then relax. So even if you do this exercise right now, where you take your two fists, tense them really, really hard, keep them tense, tense, even for about 15 seconds and then let go. And you'll find that that in itself is just a relaxing way. So these are called unmirroring exercises that you can do because you are consciously and unconsciously mirroring your interactions with your clients. Um, and by unmirroring, you are reducing the level of stress and then your distressful responses also to your client, right? Because you will have more control of your thoughts, your emotions, and your behaviors. So if we talk about physical care, that means sleep, as someone had mentioned. So we're going to start with any part of self-care plan has to include our ability to care of ourselves physically, which means that we get the sleep we need, that we nurture our bodies with healthy diet. We often, when we're stressed and depressed, People go to sugar, right? They need that lift. So they're eating candy bars, chocolate, um, or perhaps um, foods that make us essentially give us a burst of energy or coffee. Often people reach for coffee, so you get the caffeine, but that's not necessarily healthy. We know now today that even a glass of water is more revitalizing than a coffee and it's better for you. Or perhaps an apple might replenish you better than a candy bar. But we tend to, when we're stressed, go to um, things that will comfort us in different, and it's a psychological comfort. You know, chocolate bar is a psychological comfort, food, right? We need, we, and if we move to healthy diet, it actually will comfort us just the same. So I'm looking at time. I know I'm a little over. Uh, mood walking, very important. And what that means is, you know, walking through nature where the walk is really about changing your mood right? It's not a fast walk. It could be, but essentially you're trying to shift and change your mood by choosing to walk in an environment that is reflective of the mood you may desire. So if it's tranquilness, walking through an, um, perhaps the woods or a park might be that, or if it's energy you want, you walk through a city because you're seeing the, well, not these days with COVID, but in general. And then make sure that you have annual medical visits. Um, often if we're we can get news that may benefit our physical care. So taking care of yourself mentally, and sorry, I think my, my connection may be weak, so um, I'm going to go back. So we're now going to define mindfulness, right? And that's taking care of yourself emotionally and mentally. And this is what mindfulness is. So I'm going to go to our next poll. And so I'm going to launch the poll. Have any of you ever practiced mindfulness before we start to um, define it and talk about it? Oh, this is wonderful. You're such a great, great, great participants. Um, I don't think you need my presentation, or I think many of you can, um, um, I think, present yourself. So is there any other comments? Um, in, in Dina as we go. So I'm gonna end the poll. So it looks like I'm gonna share my results. 72% of you do, so that is wonderful. So you can add to this presentation, I look forward to your comments. 24% said no and 4% said they don't know. Okay, so um, I'm gonna stop sharing the results. And um, so oh, mindfulness is essentially paying attention in a particular way and this again, intentional and on purpose in the present moment, and we're doing it non judgmentally. So, for instance, I want you all to stay in the present and try not to comment on anything you see. So, for instance, you could, in your home environment, you can say, Oh, I never liked that couch. That's a judgment. But just stay in the present and be there without being judgmental 
about the exercise, about what you see, about what you smell, about what you hear, okay? So mindfulness is the non-judgmental awareness of experiences in the present moment. So often in our mind, we might go back into our past and think of something that happened yesterday or a month ago or two weeks ago or even 10 years ago, or we may be thinking about the future. What am I going to do tomorrow? Um, what if I, what tomorrow this is due, or I'm never going to be able to take that trip now because of COVID. So that's how, I'm just giving you examples of how in your mind, we're often in the present or in the past. So mindfulness is actually getting in tuned in the moment of pushing away thoughts of the past and pushing away thoughts about the future, but just being present. So keep practicing that as I move forward. So again, when we think of mindfulness, it's about the present, All right? So we move to the next slide. Oh, I think I went too fast. So, so this is how to be mindful. There is formal and informal practices. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about more formal practices. So mindful means is that when you sit down to a meal, is that you don't rush through it, is that you sit, you're aware of the tastes, of the smells, of how many times you chew, of the flavors, of the textures. So that is what mindful is. You're not just eating and thinking about, for instance, what's gonna to happen tomorrow or about some particular incident that just occurred. You stay in the present and you focus on the meal at hand, textures, smells, tastes, flavors, seasoning, and, and how they affect you, right? Do they bring pleasure to your taste buds, okay? So that is very, very important. That is what mindful eating is. That is the formal practice of mindfulness. Remember, no matter what task is at hand, that you stay in the present. Mindful walking is the same thing, is that when you walk, again, you move away from thoughts that perhaps are distressing. You move away about thoughts that happened in the past and you smell the air. You look at trees, you look at the colors, you look at the sky. So if you look at the image that's in front of you, he's just staring out and enjoying the, the visions, the sunlight and the way it streams, perhaps the formations of the clouds and the patterns of the clouds the shape and the outline of the mountains, right? So you're really, really mindful of where you're at, right? Often when we're walking, again, our mind may go to other places, right? So be aware while you're eating, while you're walking, are you breathing? Of course you're breathing, but is your breathing rapid? Is it shallow? Is it deep? Is it slow? Is your body tense? Is your body loose, right? Think of the movement where you feel it in your body, right? The sounds that are around you. Are you hearing birds? So when you walk, are you aware? Oftentimes when people, I, I know oftentimes, I rarely even, there's birds um, just singing in the morning. Um, not so much now in November, but early in April, you hear the birds singing, but I rush, take my briefcase, rush into the car, and I'm going to be late for work and worried about traffic. I don't hear the birds. I don't hear the sounds of the wind. The other day, I took a beautiful walk, and I think everyone in my house was complaining about the howling wind, but what I did was I took a walk, and I just wanted to hear the wind. There was no rustle of leaves because there weren't leaves, but there was just a howl and a screech and I could hear the branches just tipping and swaying. So it was wonderful to hear uh, the sounds of the wind and the sounds of the home. And even there was even a can that the wind was pushing so I could hear the clanking. So I was really in touch with the sound. So that's what mindfulness is, being aware of your sounds, seeing what is in front of us, right? Seeing the warmth of the, of the light in people's homes as I walked in the November darkness. And there's different shades of light. Some it was more orange. Some, I guess they had lead lighting. It was more white. There was a few Christmas lights that people have already started. Some paths were lit. Um, I looked up 
and and there was the moon and and just some light so what are taking in visually and if you ever notice often when i'm driving in toronto it's usually car after car and and all i see are the back of cars and 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 i'm tense and i feel my body tensing but often when i drive into the country and my visual field changes i feel that my body is more relaxing thoughts become really aware of your thoughts push out thoughts that are negative thoughts that are obsessive and and perhaps create distress um, so push them out Be, become more mindful of the thoughts and have more control to um, re reconstruct those thoughts the other one is emotions be aware how do i feel on this walk right so if you notice to be mindful is to be aware of all your five senses taste smell touch right um hearing right did i get them all so taste smell touch sound did i miss one anybody what's the last one we have i may have missed but anyway be aware of all the five senses and maybe someone can help me out um but essentially um that is what being mindful is so when we practice mindful it's actually mindfulness it's actually not that difficult it's really about being in the moment and really refocusing um in the activity that we're engaged in and being mindful of all the senses and how they stimulate us whether it's sound sight touch okay and in, and also in terms of our emotions and our thoughts so that is how we practice mindfulness. So, and what does it do? Well, I'll tell you, when you practice mindfulness, and this is based on emp empirical evidence, and this is studies, it reduces rumination, which means that our ruminating thoughts are, so if you're a worrier, you have obsessive ruminating thoughts, it's the same thought over and over again. Um, it will reduce the ruminations. There's a reduction in overall stress. It helps with memory it really recalibrates and sharpens our focus. We have less emotional reactivity. So when there's a situation that occurs, we don't, we're not as reactive. We actually process it and respond. So reactivity is an impulsive expression of emotion. Response is a more regulated um, emotional response to a particular situa situation. We have more cognitive flexibility. And what that means is that um, when we're reactive, we're just quickly impulsively reacting, perhaps are out through automatic thoughts and, and automatic emotional kind of reactivity. But cognitive flexibility means is when a situation occurs or an event, sorry, or an event occurs, that we are more aware of our choices and, and how we're going to respond. So we have a, we can manage and select um, what we're thinking how and thinking about how to respond to um, a particular situation. And overall, we have better relationships that improves our satisfaction with our relationship. And these are the key benefits of practicing mindfulness, whether it's at work or whether it's at home. And the more we practice mindfulness, even if it's 20 minutes a day, every day or every other day, this is what you're gonna see come out of practicing your mindfulness. So it increases our empathy, our compassion, we're more focused, so where our counseling skills or communication skills, it decreases our stress and anxiety. And overall, we have a better quality of life. We're better able to manage. We're better able to say, no, I'm turning off my phone. I'm not going to answer that email on a Saturday. That's my time, my time off. So that is how we, so we, we become essentially more in control of our lives and we choose and make um, and take options that benefit us. So... Practice gratitude, so keep a gratitude list, count your blessings, transform negative thoughts into thoughts of gratitude. Always look for that silver lining, focus on things that are working in your life versus on things that don't work. So a key is build your social network. And of course, my favorite communist Karl Marx said, surround yourself with people who make you happy, people who make you laugh, 
who help you when you're in need and people who genuinely care. So I'm gonna leave you with a final thought. Again, all related to mindfulness, stay in the moment. The practice of staying present will heal you. Obsessing about how the future will turn out creates anxiety. Replaying broken scenarios from the past causes anger and sadness. Stay here in the moment. So this is one of my favorite paintings. I love art, again by Monet. And think, look at the colors in this painting, right? The purples, a little bit of brown, a little bit of white, some blues. It may be somewhat depressing but um, in terms of the color palette, but for me, it just soothes me. So, but whatever emotion it is for you. Now, are there any other questions? I'm gonna leave you with that final quote, um, as well as this final image. Were there any questions or comments? And I'm sorry, I kind of rushed through the last few. Anything that people wanted to comment or add? Feel free to unmute your mic if you would like to speak. And I have the final, and as you're kind of thinking about it, here's the final poll, and it's around organizational protocols. So I'm curious to see, um, who is aware that their organization has policies related to self-care? This is gonna be really interesting because um, this goes back again to my initial quote when we started about Mark Twain, everybody talks about self-care, um, but no one seems to do anything about it. Um, so this is kind of encouraging. I'm gonna end the poll. So we see that 50% do. Still, there is a high number um, that either don't know or they don't have one. Um, and that's where I would like to leave you with is that is how you can advocate. Apart from, again, make sure mindfulness has to be intentional. Self-care has to be intentional um, and and self-motivated, and then you also you can advocate within your organization to bring about some of the changes, because this is really important. Really, it's not just about your own mental uh, well-being, but it's also in terms, it improves the way we interact and provide services to the clients that we deeply care about and want to help. So Dina, was there any other questions? Sorry, I know it went a little over time. No problem, uh, no questions so far. Any comments from anybody? <laughs> Many thanks. Uh, it was a great presentation. So thank you very much for that. Well, I apologize for going over time. Thank you so much for your participation and good luck in all your work. And remember um, to self-motivate and intentionally make an appointment for your self-care. The work we do is tremendously difficult and challenging emotionally, psychologically, and physically. And in order for us to improve, um, improve the delivery of our work, we really have to take care of ourselves. So I'll leave you with that. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity and the privilege to share some of my experiences and knowledge with you. And thank you, Okazi and Dina for hosting. I appreciate um, your support. And I wanna thank um, the interpreters as well um, for their um, participation in this presentation. So thank you. And until next time, take care. Bye-bye. So much Vince. Uh, and thank you all for participating in our webinar and for attending today. We'd just like to take a moment to ask you to please fill out the post uh, session survey to help us improve our future sessions as well. And thank you to everyone who's filled out the survey for the pre-session. And yeah, thank you for joining us. And uh, we hope that you'll join us for next week's webinar as well. Bye, everyone. Adina, bye, everybody. Oh, thank you, Kate. And thank you, April. Thanks, Vince. Take care. Have a nice week, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye, Dina. Bye. -bye. Bye.